Hello everyone, um, my name is Chris Schocksnetter. I'm the Livestock and Rangeland um, Extension faculty in Umatilla and Morrill counties. Um, I predominantly focus on kind of livestock and, and rangeland systems um, and utilize those on creating tools um, and especially using our livestock as a tool for ecological and landscape management decisions. Um, so today we'll talk a little bit about how to utilize those livestock as a tool for fire um, mitigation and wildfire risk assessment. Within most of our ecosystems, fire has been a prominent um, disturbance um, throughout time. But at this point in time, we're starting to see where fire can actually be a great concern in many of our ecosystems due to changes in climate, changes in the ecological process within that. We're having annual, um, annual grasses and higher density shrub cover um, in some of these places where fire can be a huge concern. And we'll talk a little bit about some of those altering fire or altering ecosystems a little bit later. But specifically in one concern, um, a great example is in East Oregon, where um, our potential listing of sage grouse has sparked a lot of discussions. And as they looked at threats to the sage grouse, the two primary threats that were identified were invasive um, species. So that included cheatgrass and the other annual grasses, as well as conifer encroachment. And both of those um, can add to the fire risk within those systems. But then the number two within that was wildfire, and that these wildfires are decreasing wildlife habitat, and our habitat is not returning back to the same habitat that was burned, as we'll see as we move forward in this conversation. Um, if you look at fire danger throughout the United States, it is definitely congregated um, on the west side. Um, and as you can see in many of our eastern counties um, here in Oregon, we have some pretty high fire significance. Um, a lot of fires have happened, some pretty big fires with some big acreage have also happened. Um, and that it's just a fairly common occurrence at this point in time to see wildfires in our systems. Another piece that's a little bit interesting on this is um, we are seeing an altering of the fire regime in what was normal or, or historic back in the day. Um, and so most of our areas that, that you can see in this in this slide is that most of our most of the areas in Oregon are actually below historical um, fire accounts as we move through. And this is due to our great suppression tactics and our ability to stop fires from, from moving forward as well as they can. But what we're starting to see now is we're starting to see that that accumulation of biomass and fuel is starting to lead to some pretty significant and dangerous fires as we move forward in the system. So when you look um, across the United States, um, our number of fires has not necessarily um, changed, as you can see from the orange line in there that we have pretty sporadic fire or pretty um as you can see in this um in this slide that the fires that we see you know can vary drastically over um per year but they really aren't on an increase or a decrease kind of remaining fairly static there but the total acres burned is on a slight upward trend where we're starting to burn more acres per fire on average. Even more alarming with that is even though we're still seeing roughly the same number of fires and maybe even could be considered a decrease in fires in the last decade, suppression costs are tremendous and we're starting to see um, fire um, suppression costs that are reaching two and three billion dollars, which has been unheard of in most of our fire time. Looking at the grazing side of things, um, there have always been animals on this landscape that have grazed these grasses and shrubs. And so starting with woolly mammoths and giant sloths and ginormous bison slash muskox, we moved into our bison, sheep, antelope, deer, elk, all of those. Um, but then we also add another layer to that um, with the human presence that we bring in domesticated livestock. 
Um, the difference within a lot of these is that our domesticated livestock are animals that we select to be in specific locations for specific times um, and have a little bit more of a management component to those where we can pick and choose what and when they do things. Over the course of time, um, we have seen livestock numbers drop in the United States. Um, during that same time frame, or this is due to the Taylor Grazing Act, um, which was induced by producers because of, um, as people would call it, the tragedy of the commons, that our public lands were being overused because everyone was trying to use as much as possible so that their neighbor didn't beat them out, essentially. Um, and so the Taylor Grazing Act was brought in by livestock producers to add some control over the use of public lands and then had a sharp decline in livestock or and had a decline in livestock numbers um, shortly thereafter, though it had been declining previously. And then the BLM brought in further management of um, unwanted lands, um, especially not including the Forest Service um, and moving forward that way. And we've slowly seen almost a plateau and getting a little bit to a certain amount of total AUMs or animal unit months. So that's equivalent to one cow and calf for one month um, on our public lands or in our grazing in general. But during the same time frame, we're also seeing a increase in cheatgrass and annual grasses. We're starting to see an increase in human development, which means that we have a lot more um, human interactions within these landscapes. And then we're starting to see effects of climate change where we have longer, hotter, drier summers. Um, and that's, that's some of the things that are increasing while at the same time that livestock have been decreasing and we're starting to see a combination of effects within all of that, um, that we see more and bigger fires throughout the whole thing. When it comes to livestock grazing, there is kind of a give and take within all of it because severe, increase, or severe grazing can increase our shrub density um, which is not necessarily what we want for fire mitigation. Um, we can start losing our grasses, especially our perennial and um, native grasses that are beneficial in these ecosystems. And then that also, with those two degradation effects, that opens up opportunities for annual grasses to move in and occupy space within a landscape. Um, low to moderate grazing, um, as you can see, on or has a very little effect on those perennial grasses. So if you look in this, in this site, a completely ungrazed plant all the way down to a fairly severe grazed plant and the root effect on those plants that happens afterwards. So going, taking about 50% of the upper dry matter right here, you see very little um, effects of root densities in the bottom. It will affect them some, but that is definitely something that a plant can easily recover from. And then taking that one step further, you start seeing a pretty drastic effect on reducing those, reducing that roots and then taking it down pretty strong can, can affect it also. And this is very dependent on site condition and then also dependent on time of year. So when those grasses are actively growing and trying to put out um, seed heads and reproductive organs or reproductive um, components, this grazing can have a higher effect on it than when that plant has gone dormant and has stored most of its energy in the roots to start with. Um, so when we look at manipulating fire behavior and utilizing livestock to do it, um, I really like this, this diagram right here because it's fairly basic on what we can control. Um, and so essentially a fire needs fuel, um, heat, and oxygen in order to sustain itself. And when we have a wildfire event, we have no control of the oxygen that's in the air or the heat that is produced by the fire itself at that point in time. The only thing that we can control at that point in time is the fuel. And that is something that we can control through mowing, doing some of those things. I'm sure most of you have seen, you know, disc lines um, and have done that in wheat fields, especially during a wildfire event, to try to alter that fuel and stop that fire. And But utilizing livestock prior to is another one of those methods. Um, so when we look at this and we'll look at what livestock can do, we have 
various differences between herbaceous or woody and woody vegetation. So our herbaceous vegeta vegetation in this picture, cheatgrass predominantly, is our primary fuel for ignition. So lightning strikes will generally get that to start fairly quickly. Um, sparks from a chain on a highway can get that started up. Um, overheating a tractor, something like that. That is the generally the primary fuel that starts that fire and can take it quickly uh, or and can build quickly and move it fast. And so you have, but with this fire or with those grass or herbaceous material, you have low fire intensity and, and fairly low severity most of the time. Um, our woody vegetation acts as ladder fuel. Um, so if it wants to go into trees and other things, those shrub components can help put it or help it um, reach up into the canopy of a larger tree. You generally see higher flame lengths, um, more intensity of that fire. You have more more vegetation or more fuel to burn and a higher concentration of fuel to burn. Um, more burn severity, and then you have smoldering towards the end, which increases that prolonged smoke. If you're looking at um, quality of life and different things for other people, as well as opportunities for that fire to flare up again, um, should conditions arise. So with all of this, where do livestock fit in and where does grazing fit in? Um, so grazing can affect the fuel loads. When you look at these two pictures, um, something that's been ungrazed for several years has a lot of dead and decadent material especially grasses, dead and decking material um, surrounding it that is a very great conductor for fire to, to start moving and propagate that fire along. Um, on this bottom one, this grazed plant, it has less material on it to burn and more live material, which is going to be more difficult to grow or more difficult to start burning um, in the beginning, especially early on in the season when it is actively growing. Um, this is a pretty classic one from a fire in Idaho that burned over 600,000 acres. Um, the, it's a pretty stark difference from the ungrazed sagebrush on the left, which is solid black because of that high severity, high fuel load, and then a, I believe it's a crested wheat field um, seeding out there that was ungrazed that basically burned in the entirety and then moved into that same crested wheat field um, seeding and that was grazed and you can see how that fire starts to fizzle and and peter out and you start creating a mosaic pattern and that mosaic pattern is very important when it comes to um, seed propagation and resiliency on the landscape because each one of those unburned areas hopefully contains plants that you want to continue in the system and they can act as seed sources to seed or reseed that um, burned area as well. So down in burns, there has been um, a fair bit of studies done that look at fire and grazing, um, specifically one that they did in um, 2009 was they looked at um, grazed and ungrazed areas and then set some of those on fire um, to see what happened. And so in these sites that they used, um, there were livestock enclosures that were built in the 19, or 1936, and their um, cattle have not been in those or exclosures um, until they or from this entire time frame. And so there's been over 40 years of no grazing. At the point in time when they started the study and evaluated it, they could find no difference in plant density and no difference in plant characteristics between the two, uh, between the grazed and ungrazed areas. And then livestock were grazed at moderate levels, about 30 to 40 percent utilization. So in, so again, in um, 92 and 93, plant cover density and biomass production were very similar in the grazed and ungrazed areas. Um, the only difference was that litter biomass, so that amount of dead vegetation of previous year's growth on those grasses was almost twofold higher in the exclosures. And then in the fall of 1993, they burned them. And so can anyone guess what those, what the differences happened in plant communities after they burned them? 
So 15 years post-prescribed burns in the grazed areas, they saw more perennial bunch grasses um, and still had a still had a memory of what that system looked like prior to. In the ungrazed area, they almost lost all of their bunch grasses um, and it significantly increased cheatgrass and, or invasion within those areas and and move forward to a cheatgrass cycle. And once again, I want to emphasize within these two pictures that both of these sites 15 years prior looked exactly the same before they, or, or looked virtually the same before they were burned. And so having some grazing on that landscape definitely prevented a native, or, or prevented the cheatgrass from completely taking over within that system. And so when we look at that fire cycle and why this is important, our natural historic fire cycle is that we have um, a shrub grass kind of circular loop where we have a fire that happens and then we go into a grass forb dominant area and then the shrubs slowly come back into play and then the shrubs slowly take over and then it burns again and then it goes back into that grass system. The problem with cheat grass is because, because it dries up so fast in the beginning of the year and then acts as a really good um, conductor to propagate that fire and fills in all the interim space there it burns pretty quick and pretty fast and so once cheatgrass becomes fairly dominant then we start seeing more and more frequent fires and as we see more and more frequent fires sagebrush and other shrubs have a really hard time competing within that system and then eventually we start losing our bunch grasses and our native vegetation as well because it just is not designed to handle that much fire The other one that they looked at um, was in 2015. Um, they looked at winter grazing effects um, on herbaceous fuel and how that changed, how that changed um, fire behavior the following year. So basically grazing in the fall for a benefit the following year. And so when they looked at this, um, you had ungrazed versus winter grazed areas here in the white and the black. And the fuel moisture within the plant community stayed fairly flat right around that 20% and then dropped down to, I think it's roughly 15% by September in the ungrazed areas, but was as high as 70% to start with in the winter grazed areas and then slowly dropped down to about 20% by September. And the main difference with this is that um, litter cover and all of that previous year's growth accumulation around those plants. So it's not like um, the grazing actually added moisture to the plants, but what it did is it removed that dry and decadent material that quickly dries out in the beginning of the fire season and reduces that overall fuel moisture for the whole system. But most importantly with all of this is um, 20 percent fuel moisture is about the level that is required um, at the highest level for a wildfire to propagate start or to, for a wildfire to start and generally to continue and propagate into a into a larger significant fire and so you can see specifically within this line that in the middle of July um, is when a ungrazed area starts becoming prone to fire behavior or prone to wildfire events. Whereas that winter grazed area, if it had a lightning strike all the way up through August, there is a chance that that fire is not going, or that that will not create a wildfire. And that there's enough fuel moisture in that fuel that it might send a little bit around that surrounding area of the lightning strike, but not necessarily move into a full scale wildfire. So when we're looking at this and we want to look at fire break implementation, um, our biggest things that we're, that we're trying to do is trying to reduce flame height and rate of spread and increase our chances at stopping a wildfire. These things have to be strategically placed where they can be utilized for the greatest benefit on a landscape level. And then they're also there when you need them. And so that means that 
the fire break is in place and ready to go when a wildfire has to happen. And due to the scale of some of these things, the econo or it needs to be economical to create and maintain because the, it's just not feasible to spend a bunch of money on something of this nature and at this scale to, to create the benefits. So one of the projects that I did for my master's was evaluating um, the use of livestock grazing to create and maintain fire breaks. And so we had a, a place where we did a 30 meter or about 100 foot pre-ignition zone where we left ungrazed for two years and then we utilized our grazing um, in low and moderate utilizations along with a no grazing section and then set that whole thing on fire and allowed that pre-ignition zone to create what was a mock wildfire moving into those those potential fire breaks to see what would happen. And this is one of the greatest things about this is you can look at One of the biggest things that you want to see is how fast this fire moves through these compared to this unfazed area. And knowing that there's a couple of minutes of time that that fire gets to move through that unfazed area before it gets to the unfazed section. <coughs> You even have a problem with your dip torque and has to switch out, so that takes even more time for that wild or for that fire to build um, before it hits those grazed areas. And these poles are about 10 meters in and 20 meters in from from the end of the fire or from the end of the, the plot. So there's a little bit of the treatment area before the flame or before the poles and a little bit afterwards as well. And you get to hear the fun of uh, the fire crew burn, or burning or harassing each other. Um, one thing as we're doing this is I do want to mention that we're very grateful for the BLM and some of the things that they did for us because we had a tremendous amount of help and 27 crew members on this prescribed burn to help us out. Um, and they did a lot of training on themselves or with themselves and had some fun that way and then had a good opportunity to learn from that. But this would not have been, this fire would not have happened had, had, the, had the BLM not helped us um, in that regard. So as you can see, right here, these fires are just about getting into those grazed areas and already this one has built up and is almost through halfway through that ungrazed area. And you can see flame heights get up. These are about 20 foot poles. So you're looking at probably close to 15 feet right there. Um, but at this point in time, that fire has gone completely through the ungrazed area. And you can kind of see right here that they may have gone through some of the grazed areas already by that point. And then we're going to lose sight of everything here soon when they put a dozer right in front of us. Um, but there is even in some of these plots down here that the fire didn't even continue all the way through that plot. Well, I guess it's not a dozer, it's a super, a super tanker. I will note that this um, prescribed burn happened within a half a mile of the soda fire, and it was about two weeks after they fired. Um, one of the biggest... of shrub cover that it has on fire behavior and so specifically flame height and so as shrub cover increases to about 20 percent or better 
we start getting to a point where the flame heights get big enough where we have to use um, heavy equipment to mitigate those fires. Whereas shrub cover below that, it's, it can vary and grazing can have an effect on it. But once we get above 20%, as you can see here, no grazing versus any type of grazing can have about the same amount, the same effect on wildfire. It's just that the shrubs carry through the canopy and there's not much that you can do about it. So as we're looking at that, grazing can be used to impact um, and implement fire breaks. Um, and we did find out that they can be used at the beginning of the season and be ready when you need them. Um, and then anything specifically over 30%, um, it's going to carry through the canopy regardless. 20% is still pushing, I would say. So as we're looking at that for our management implications, um, shrub, co shrub cover must be addressed before any grazing can be effective. And that may be, you know, some type of grazing of other species. So maybe bringing in goats to help manage the, the shrub cover if, if someone wanted to, to deal with the heartache of managing goats. Um, this type of uh, management strategy needs to be different than operational pasture management. So the goal is fuel reduction, not livestock production. Um, and then low stress handling and supplemental blocks can help and so that can also utilize and push cattle into or push livestock into areas that you want them to be. Um, the, one of the biggest things is cooperation of fuel managers and producers is key. And so generally when we're talking about wildfire mitigation, there's not a single producer that's going to have enough property to implement that 100% on their land. And so there's going to be cooperation with fuel managers to mix that or, or to coordinate that and plan fuel breaks and everything together so that they can be managed as one. Well. Um, one of the biggest things um, this graph is pretty, pretty influential on is that as weather severity increases, as our sagebrush load increases, so this arrow coming down, um, our, or our brush cover increases, our effects of livestock grazing become less and less. And so I think in the long draw fire, we saw some pretty extreme fire behavior where there were some impressive flame heights and rate of spread off of stubble. And so when we get to that level, um, even grazing may not necessarily be that. A fire behavior so can do that. There's almost not a can be stubble. And that I would like to listen in. Um, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to be there in person to answer any questions, um, but we'll go from there. And thank you very much.